Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Langley, and this is the Manufacturing IT Podcast. Each week, I speak with key stakeholders, industry titans, and some of the legends who are advancing manufacturing and digitalization across all sectors. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are a little wiser afterwards. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Manufacturing IT Podcast. A great episode coming up today, I'm sure. Joined today by Daniel Pomerantz. Daniel, your uh, background is in low-code operational intelligence. You've just set up your company. So welcome to the podcast, and thanks for taking the time to to talk with me. Thank you so much. And we've agreed I'm Dan and you're Daniel for the sake of this show. (laughs) But uh, Or no, I got that backwards, but regardless. Yeah, uh, excited to be here and and listening to your shows the past few weeks, getting caught up, uh, some really amazing guests you've had and some great content, great questions all throughout. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. For those listening and watching, maybe you could give us a bit of an intro uh, into who you are, what you do, and, and your background, Daniel. Yep, yep. So I'm obviously a little bit younger than some of your guests, but I think I have a lot of experience at the ground level of manufacturing operations. And mm. to go back on that, I kind of have traveled this saga, starting with SAP warehousing systems, working on the most complex and rigid enterprise software systems around. So I worked in grocery warehousing for a little while, but then stumbled into manufacturing. And I worked for three years in medical device and pharmaceutical products manufacturing as an MES analyst. And that's where I really learned the usefulness of MES data and why it's so necessary but also the struggles of typical classic MES systems. I lived the struggle. So I was the, you know, head analyst for an entire division of MES systems that were implemented in the 90s. It was an older version of Siemens Ops Center. And I knew every nook and cranny of that platform, Mm. but it hit limits all the time. And it was slow and any additional changes were going to require external resources or significant investment. And that's when I came across Tulip. So Tulip is what brought me into the low-code space. For those who don't know, Tulip is effectively the premier low-code MES option out there and kind of got drawn into this idea that I could build my own MES. And I was like, wow, that's cool. That's exactly what I want to do. Obviously learned along the way that it's not always as straightforward as just uh, <laughs> sitting down and building some things. But I got to work in a consultative role, working with businesses of all different industries all around the world, doing tons of random you know, MES projects, some LIM software, CMMS type solutions. So I really got a breadth of experience And that sort of led me to thinking that I wanted to go out on my own. Mm. And so about six months ago, I started my business, Low Code Operational Intelligence. And I believe I am the only business that is focused on building low code applications for manufacturing shop floors. I'm curious if there are any else out there. So (laughs) please let me know. But that's what I'm trying to have be my bread and butter. I have a lot of opinions on the topic and I'm always learning more. Excited to share some of that with you today. Yeah, no, I think really good overview and intro, uh, Daniel. So thanks for that. One of the things that appealed to me about having you on the show and sharing your your insight with us and, and the audience is the fact that, yeah, as you say, maybe what you're lacking is, you know, young entrepreneur starting up a service business in the low code space. All I hear about is the adoption of low-code software applications, low-code technology, specifically with MES. So what I wanted to do is is maybe kind of use this as an intro episode, talking about the rise and popularity of low-code MES, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe share some of your thoughts and ideas on on how low-code MES scales, maybe some of the pitfalls, the challenges versus on-premise, that kind of thing, really give the, the audience and listenership an insight, some more wisdom from from you. And you're going to talk us through maybe a bit of a demo as well later in the episode. So my goal really is to to kind of leave uh, leave everyone a little bit wiser when it comes to low-code MES after this episode. Yeah, totally agree. And I think the the synopsis of low-code as it has evolved over the past, I would say, 20 years. So that's something a lot of people don't realize. Even though the terminology no-code, low-code didn't really come out until maybe 
five to 10 years ago is when it really became a buzzword. Platforms have been around that enable you to build complex software through drag and drop functionality. Mm. And at its core, that's what it is. The most prominent example that almost all of us use every day, Microsoft Excel. Yeah. You can do some really cool and complex things with Microsoft Excel. I now, can. should you? <laughs> <laughs> there are people who can do amazing things with Excel. <laughs> and yeah. that is just one example. Now, over the past decade, we've seen a few dozen software companies, probably more than I even acknowledge enter this space and dedicate a ton of resources to, you know, everyone wants to be the next Excel. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone ever will be because Excel is the king, right? But there are so many different ways that you can now build websites, build applications, build business intelligence. So even things like Tableau, Power BI, those are low code tools, mm -hmm. right? And that flexibility is just becoming ubiquitous with software. And that's where I think of low code, no code as sort of a spectrum. Like you can even argue that some programming languages represent low code, right? Where you're able to copy and paste snippets of code and use rather simple programming libraries to mm -hmm. create pretty complex applications, but it's still much easier than it used to be. So it's quite a broad term, but the main idea I think is that technology has gotten so good that these software companies can now provide tools that enable non-software individuals like you and I to build technology that previously required much more resources. Yeah, Daniel, and one of the things that I find really interesting with no code, and you know, I guess it's a buzzword now, but but as you say, tech that's been around for a while, is who's driving the adoption and explosion of kind of applications in this space? Because yep. traditional buyers have changed now. You know, from a, a software company five, 10 years ago, they would love to sell you, you know, tons of professional services, tons of services to customize, edit, develop, and have those huge service con service dollars to go alongside the license dollars. But obviously yep. with low-code platforms, citizen developers, business users are now using the applications. Vendors are maybe losing out on some of those service dollars. So who's driving the adoption on kind of low-code, no-code platforms, do you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it opens up a whole world of conversation on how things go on these implementations, but you do basically see the two different versions of low code adoption. So you have the bottom up where a hungry engineer finds a tool, says, this is what we need, uses it, shows his boss and says, wow, this is great. And you know, it might spread, especially if they're good at it, right? Then there's the alternative approach where an executive you know, has been on the ground level, recognizes the possibilities for this type of technology, bets on it, says, you know, I want this one division to try it out. And from there, because of that leadership position, generally it will spread faster because mm -hmm. resources can be allocated to sort of invest in the future. So you see both of those in the low code space. I think both are great. There can be different strategies for spreading effectively when you have those two different angles. But the nice thing is that now you have two options. In the past, the latter option was the only thing that ever happened. Yeah. You know, no manufacturing engineer at your site in Ohio was ever going to be able to influence the software that a company was using, which is kind of a shame because sometimes those are the people that know what you need the best. Yeah, no, for sure. And I guess if we if we kind of centralize this conversation around MES, because that's where your background mm -hmm. is, my background mm -hmm. is. MES, from my perspective, you know, four major stakeholders in engineering, IT, manufacturing, quality, and maybe some nuances there. But traditionally, I guess, from a, an MES platform, you've got to get buy-in from all different stakeholders and, and different um, expectations on things from there. With the rise of low code and some of the applications maybe that we've you've mentioned, where does the ownership go for the platform then? Who's in charge and, and who are the kind of key stakeholders with the deployment here? Yep. So let's take those two stories that I brought out earlier. At the beginning, you know, there might be one small team at a plant that finds Tulip and uses it to generate value. Hmm. But 
when you start hitting scale or if you're going with a more top down approach, you want to be thinking about those questions much earlier and devising your organization almost and your responsibilities around it. So I do think that even with these low code approaches, you generally want to have some small team that is in charge of your data model or your general strategy with the systems. Usually in larger enterprises, there's already an IoT architect and maybe a few other related roles. So this fits perfectly in there. This also gets into the argument of whether that team should sit under IT or under operations, Mm. which I think is going to depend organization to organization. I'm an operations guy, so my bias is always that the (laughs) incentives of operations make it smarter to have that control on the ops side. However, I understand from IT security and regulatory reasons, sometimes different businesses needed in the IT org. So Mm. there is those two angles and that team needs to, at minimum, regulate what the data structures that each of the lower level tulip or low code champions are going to be using. Yes. Okay. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And I guess for a lot of the listeners and people interested in this topic, they're going to be coming from traditional MES backgrounds, you know, all of the the usual suspects on the MES side, and maybe kind of not too familiar with some of the different MES vendors now that are in the low code space, and maybe not even understanding a low code MES that would scale into a global template or, you know, a multi-site, even across just the States, for example. So talk us through, Daniel, how like a, a low code MES would would scale. Yep. So again, there's those two versions, right? There's that version where someone starts small and isn't necessarily thinking about scale. And in those scenarios, you see the value, but you have to sort of eventually come in and reorganize to prepare for scale. So let's ignore that. And let's assume that you're going in and you have you know, a vision that you want to use low code as your MES, and you have two sites that need a new MES right now. It all really starts with data modeling and having control of the core data structure. So I'm actually going to share my screen. I apologize to anyone listening. If you can enable, there's this kind of pyramid that I think of with modeling your MES data. So I, right. And that central group needs to early on in a low code MES implementation, really define what data is going to be used and captured. You can see my screen now. Yeah. So when you go into this, this central team wants to think about what data needs to end up in my ERP system? What data does every plant need to use so that I can do comparisons across different plants? And as a part of that data modeling, you eventually hit a level where you need to give your businesses and eventually your actual process lines the flexibility to deviate from that model and or to add data capture tables to those models. And that's where the low code approach really differs is that with a classic MES, the ball really stops after these top two layers. Yeah. And your data modeling is a pre-planned exercise where you lay out all the tables you think you'll ever need and then you're done. That's what everyone gets. When you're going with this low code approach, you need to go in anticipating there will be tables that get added. And those tables maybe start out at one business and grow to others, or they maybe are only ever used by that business. And you need to have processes and a defined understanding that this flexible table system is going to happen no matter what you do. And Hmm. honestly, this is exactly what's already happening with Microsoft Excel at plants. So if you think about these top two sections as the core MES that that a lot of classical uh, manufacturer, older systems are already using, 
These lower level tables are happening in Excel sheets right next to the MES in those facilities. And so when you go into these MES at scale conversations with the low code approach, you basically do the same exercise where you're identifying your core tables, but you need to go in with the sort of open mindset that some businesses are going to add tables and you may need to, over time, formulate that into your larger table structure or just have documentation why different businesses require different structures. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to understand these parameters. And I guess a big part of what you're doing now with and your educational series on the YouTube videos is really making people aware of how some of this flexibility and, and even the agility in the mindset of a deployment um, is going to be helpful. Yeah, you said the perfect word, agility. This is all about enabling those businesses that current state are using Excel sheets to handle all sorts of craziness that the IT architects never imagined would need to be getting done at a manufacturing level. And by establishing these top level tables and these top level data models, you're creating that scalable control and mm -hmm. that consistency across all of your businesses, but you're leaving the door open for you know that process engineer with a good idea at business plan one to make some improvements that really help that plan. Yeah. And I guess empowering that process engineer or empowering that worker to you or to create a system or to create a, a data set that is going to be useful for them. Yep. That's a great value add as well. Yep. Yep. So Dan, let me ask you this really, because obviously you've now created your your business, low code operational intelligence. You know, I know you're you're heavily working closely with Tulip, but and your background was working at Chile. But let me ask you yep. why you decided to really focus your, your energies on the Tulip platform. What is it that you see with, with, with Tulip that is the reason why? Yep. So I try to have these conversations as objectively as possible with my clients. I go into every client visit saying, my company is founded upon this technology. If you would like to investigate alternatives to Tulip, I'm all for it. And I'd love to be a part of that. However, I am extremely comfortable with Tulip and I'm able to move quickly. I have a long history using Tulip and it's the only low code platform that I'm aware of that is completely dedicated to the manufacturing and operational space. So that focus brings about a few primary benefits to any company in this space. Mm. I think the easiest and most obvious is compared to other low code platforms, Tulip has far and away the most native machine connectivity, equipment connectivity, barcode scanners, mm -hmm. label printing. Obviously, anything's possible with almost all of the low code platforms. But what you can do out of the box with Tulip, and even some of their edge devices that they sell natively, make it, in my opinion, the fastest and most optimal route to go if you are working in an environment where you're going to be connecting to machines, equipment, that sort of thing. So that's where my head goes. Mm. I think another differentiating thing of Tulip that I will admit can be a good thing or a bad thing. So I like to you know be open. I think Tulip is really focused on building simpler and having an app building platform that is adoptable by many non-technical users. Yeah. And that is often a very good thing. I think it's a huge part of my business is helping young manufacturing engineers grow and be able to build Tulip apps and think more as a IT role in addition to their manufacturing background. There are other low code platforms that really interest me because they are like way more complex and therefore have a higher ceiling than some of what Tulip can do. And I think there are, are situations where that's worth pursuing. Again, and I mentioned this earlier, there's also, you know, this idea of using programming libraries as a sort of low code option, right? So you could program an MES, which comes with all sorts of unlimited capabilities, but the cost there is that it's going to be harder to learn. So there's a spectrum. I think Tulip does fall into the category and they and market themselves as being easy to learn and therefore able to spread throughout your organization and be widely adoptable. 
Yeah, a win-win for, for both the user and the seller. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and I think what I appreciate, so I've been, you know, as I told you off camera, Daniel, being involved in MES for probably the last 10 years and, you know, seeing yep. the market change so much over the last maybe three or four years with some of them, I call the new kids on the block, but, you know, the, the companies like Tulip, Apprentice, and, and some of the other companies that are disrupting the traditional MES landscape. And I think a rising tide lifts all ships. And, you yep. know, we're talking about empowering workforce, manufacturing engineers and, and shop floor operators, but also adding mass value to, to manufacturing companies. So, yeah, I appreciate the spectrum we're talking about. And I guess from everyone's perspective, there's there's a piece of the market to, to play in. Yep, totally. And, you know, I go into every project, you know, what I do this for is all about creating efficiencies in a manufacturing facility. You know, I've had a client in the past tell me that they were interested in spending all this money on and on lights so that an operator, if they had an issue, could turn on a red light above and voila, everyone in the plant would see there's an issue there. And I told them, I said, you're better off going to the Home Depot, buying 20 broomsticks and red solo cups because it's just as easy to tape a broomstick next to your workbench, put a red solo cup right on top whenever you have an issue. No software required. You don't have to hire me for anything. It's a win for manufacturing. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> no software is the best software. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Well, look, I think one of the things that I think you're going to talk us through now is is a bit of a demo on uh, of a low-code MES. And I assume it's going to be a Tulip platform. But I think people watching, and sorry for those just listening, but I think this is going to be a really powerful way for for people to maybe get familiar with, uh, with Tulip or, or at least a low-code MES platform. Totally. Yeah. I'm excited for this. Again, if those who are just listening, please feel free to reach out and uh, I'm happy to go over these types of demos anytime at all. I love this stuff. I think it's the future of manufacturing. I'm going to walk through a few different setups of mm -hmm. an MES in Tulip, the low-code platform we've been talking about. I think a lot of these types of applications could be developed in many other low-code platforms. Mm -hmm. I'll show a few ways that Tulip um, has been really easy to build these in and really easy to integrate some simulated machines into these demos. But the, the core idea remains the same, right? An MES is the interface which an operator is keeping track of which orders they are working on, at what station, what materials they're using, how long things are taking. So Across these demos, we'll see a few examples of those. This first one is an example in a very high rate manufacturing environment. So in this case, we are taking work orders for rotors. So on the left side, you see a list of work orders coming in from an ERP system. We see on the right side some performance metrics for how my you know, work cell or maybe my individual self is performing today. And we can see some additional information about the order. Let's go ahead and begin this order. So a huge piece of MES, and in this case, we have an example that's really married to the type of product that we're making, is your traceability. So with this application, we've got custom labeling of which materials you're going to be scanning. And all of this traceability is gonna be saved in your tulip tables. And again, this is a high rate manufacturing process. So in this example, we are going to go straight to a work instruction step, which I am going to repeatedly cycle through as an operator. Hmm. The nice thing that I really like about this app is if I'm an experienced operator, I don't necessarily need to go through each of these work instructions, but because of these these nice buttons that have been added at the bottom of the screen. If I'm a newer operator, I can quickly click through, you know, I can go back and review any specific instructions for how to perform this step. And as I move through, this is where, you know, at first low code MESs can be very work instructions heavy, but in addition to work instructions, everything that I'm doing is being captured with my current logged in user and my timestamp. So all my clicks, everything that I'm doing here can be tracked and attributed to my user. And slowly, we're seeing more functionality throughout this 
MES. Mm -hmm. Here, we're tracking the amount of units that we've completed. Maybe I want to skip ahead and complete all units just for speed. However, we can also see logging defects. So I'm going to log a defect. And in this case, we're tracking defective materials. I might point out that these rotor shafts have an issue. Um, perhaps there's an issue with the mechanical fit of this rotor shaft plot. And I want to report that five of them were defective, uh, did not fit in the rotor chamber. And that might print out a ticket that would get slapped onto a few bagged up materials. But I'm able to continue my processing. Again, this becomes the hub that the operator performing this task works on. No, I was going to say, I think from my perspective, you know, we've been recruiting for Tulip this year and had some really good conversations last year with Gilad and, and some of the other key players at Tulip. And I think one of the things that I found really impressive is that the idea of empowering frontline operators and frontline workers. I mean, given all of the drama we had with COVID, facilities being shut down, an aging workforce and you know, the talent shortages, skills gap, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Having a, an easy platform like this and an easy workforce operation instructions, you're able to upskill your operators much quicker and you don't need that kind of tribal, you know, 25 years experience, someone just showing you how it's done. You've got a step-by-step -step manual built in. Yep. And one of the things I see the most all the time is an operator will come in and say, you know, this work instruction is wrong. We should change that. And in the past, that might require all sorts of, you know, bureaucracy to get that changed. With Tulip, you can go in, just change the text field the same way you would a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And now the next operator is receiving the previously tribal knowledge, right? In a legacy system, it would have had to be tribal knowledge. But with Tulip, you can quickly make all sorts of changes um, to these applications. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and sign off on this work order and let's move on to the next demo. So again, this was an example of like a really high rate production where you're repeating over and over again a single task in a actual plant environment just so people can see what that might look like. You would have a series of applications just like the one I showed for each process mm -hmm. in your manufacturing process. And over this demo, obviously, sometimes this isn't the most reasonable thing. You can't have a thousand tulip apps for the 1,000 different processes. So I'm going to get there and show a little bit about what that looks like. Hmm. I want to show an admittedly less beautiful example, but this is from a customer that I've worked with. So we're now going a little bit further down the, the um, rate of production scale. And here we're looking at a MES system for laminating rolls of material together. So kind of imagine it's Christmas season. Imagine two rolls of wrapping paper that you are unraveling and ironing together is okay. effectively what this workstation is doing. And this is an example where we have a really big machine that we want to be running 100% of the time. It's our you know, bottleneck asset. And so we can see right away in the bottom of the screen, unfortunately, for the past two hours or maybe two minutes, this machine has been down. And this is the hub where the operator or potentially operators are interacting with this machine. So we can see a list of upcoming work orders. Mm. And when we click on them, the system has information about which materials are needed for this work order. And in the far right, we can see some recipe values. So oftentimes recipes get configured at the MES level. In this example, Tulip has a separate configuration app where these recipes are maybe configured by a subset of users who have certain access. Now, What's really cool is in this scenario, we need to load our materials. So again, component traceability is a huge piece of MES. So I wanna produce this gray laminate. So I need to put on a gray roll of backer. So I'm gonna to go to my material change screen and here I'm getting visibility into the available components mm -hmm. where I can select a specific lot of laminate and a specific lot of backer. 
Now, physically, I would have to, of course, put these lots onto the machine. Hopefully, there's you know some barcode scanning involved there for Pocoyoke purposes. There's some extra functionality baked in here that allows users to send requests to the warehouse. So if I remember correctly, this is through Microsoft Teams, or maybe there's a separate application system, but a user can send information to the warehouse to say, hey, I need some more of this material. In this case, we are ready to roll. And now we should be able to begin that work order. So we can see the materials required are this ZZX and this gray roll. And in the bottom right, we can see that we have those two materials loaded into our machine mm. and we can begin processing. Now here, I'm not sure how accurate all of this simulated data is, but the idea that's attempting to be shown is that we now are getting information from this continuously running machine and incorporating that into our MES application. So this laminator is rolling on through and we can see our completion quantity ticking upwards at some you know consistent rate. I think it's mm -hmm. correlated with the run speed of the recipe. And as we move forward, we're able to complete this application. So that's all I'm going to show there because I think this next demo is yeah. what will really hit home. But here we're starting to see that machine connectivity, again, built entirely in a low code platform. Really cool piece of the tool platform. Look, Daniel, why, why, are you, why are you saying this? I think one of the things that <clears throat> I know when I've had conversations with people objectively about MES as such is, is because this is a newer way of working and, you know, maybe some of the technology and platforms haven't been around for as long as the you know other vendors in this space what can you say to or say to people that are maybe skeptical or, or nervous about taking such a, a modern approach to to such a pivotal piece of, of software in their process totally right it's about you know taking a risk and deviating from tried and true technology yeah i think the point that i would emphasize the most is that if you have smart people who have experience with manufacturing and these more classical MES solutions, a lot of the patterns can be carried over. Now, with this new technology, you need to deviate. And again, it comes back to having smart, innovative individuals. But if there are things that you really liked about classical MES, you could carry that with you. You know, let's say you want to have standard data collection tables the exact same way that you used to in Camstar or Siemens Op Center, you can do that with low code. You can still set up tables very similarly. You can enforce different data structures to be used in all of your low code applications. And over time, you might learn that that's not the way to go. Over mm -hmm. time, you'll learn how to evolve. But the flexibility and the agility of the technology, you can still do a lot of what you're using. And that's where... Obviously, there's the gap of learning the new technology, but once you get the hang of that, everything is up to the architect and the users of the platform. The flexibility, obviously, at first it can be daunting, mm. but eventually it is only a strength. Okay. No, cool. That's, a, I think, good reassurance there for, for many. Yep. Now, this last example is going to be a totally opposite scenario from that first example I showed where you have 10 minutes manufacturing processes and 10 Tulip apps. In this case, we want to understand Tulip at the scale of thousands of processes. Hmm. I think eventually, best case scenario, you do want to end up with one app for every unique process that you have or one app for each SKU that you have, depending on your business. Hmm. But the reality is that that's difficult for some businesses to start off with. So in this example, I'm going over sort of a configurable MES, which should be familiar to people who use classic MES type systems, where every work order has a predefined route, oftentimes coming from an ERP system. Mm -hmm. And this MES application is going to go through these routes and the route is what is configurable. So instead of having to make a unique app for this V1 thruster or a unique app for this health monitoring work step. You just need to make a few different templates 
And Tulip and other low-code platforms can sort of tie these all together, again, using that low-code logic. So here, perfectly proving my point, the first step in this manufacturing process, maybe eventually we want this to be a custom Tulip app, but for now, we have a really good SOP that our operators love. No problem, right? Let's just put the PDF into your Tulip app. And we can add a little bit of augmentation so that, you know, we might timestamp when the operator is done with this SOP. Yeah. But if it's already good and I don't want to invest resources in recreating this PDF, let's put it in there. And as I move through these steps, we're staying within the confines of the same data structures. So this is really... Again, it's kind of that classical MES mentality where, okay, we have predefined text, an image, maybe along the way we want to report defect events or add attachments. So at any point we can, again, within the confines of the same application, switch to these screens that allow us to add attachments. And as you move forward, you can also set up different types of templates. So in this step, we have a critical component traceability, right? So hopefully you'd have a barcode scanner, but maybe you type in a lot number that you want to be associated with what you're working on. And again, all of this has been defined using a route builder. Mm -hmm. So this is not a custom Tulip app. So if you have thousands of parts, it's very easy to upload a spreadsheet that contains the configuration of all these different systems. The final piece that I think really kind of connects all of this together comes about when I got to this helium leak test. So I was moving through that route, click, 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 following normal processes. But let's say that my business specifically, right, maybe my entire company is using that larger app, but my business specifically has this helium leak test where we want very critical work instructions or very critical data collection. I have now broken off from that shell app mm -hmm. to a custom app that was added in later. So at first we were just using that shell app. But again, the goal is to eventually create these custom applications for your most important processes at the least. Yeah. And so now with this Helium leak test, we have a very special set of instructions, videos, so that we know this helium leak test is set up. And then this one's pretty cool. Uh, we actually are going to be streaming in some simulated helium leak data that will eventually be captured in a uh, PDF that's generated. Looks like my video froze. You can still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, yeah. All right, well, I'll freeze frame it. As this goes on, I'm going to hit finish testing. Things are a little bit busted right now, but I assure you it's all working correctly. This application is expecting to capture two separate continuous data streams of Helium leak testing. So I'm just going through this, speeding through, and this custom app is going to determine whether or not that Helium leak data passed. Different things might occur if you are in a failing range or maybe you're in a range where you need to retest. All sorts of different possibilities are now available to us in this separate custom application. Another nice thing here, and this is always good to show, is I can generate a PDF report of the data that was captured. Mm -hmm. So a really nice feature of Tulip, whether this is going to a customer or if it's just used for internal documentation, really nice to be able to generate those PDFs. And now once I'm all done, I mark complete and it's going to bring me back to the shell that I was in before. So here it's saying a custom application step has been completed and I can move forward just like it was for any other step. So this is that concept that I like to show people who are worried about Tulip at scale. Mm. I do think the goal is to eventually get to many interconnected applications for your many different processes. But a really nice thing to see, and it also shows the ceiling of the complexity that you can build with Tulip, is these shell applications that are able to be used for many different products. Yeah, I think this is really interesting from my side, Daniel, from getting under the hood with the platform and seeing some of the capabilities. I've never sat through an MES demo 
believe it or not, and I've spoke about it for the last 10 years. So from my side, really interesting to see. But I think also from the audience watching in as well, you know, I know we're talking about Chile, but but I think really it also shows some of the usability and, and configurability for other, other users. Yep. And the weird thing with low code again is like, obviously I'm showing you MES focused mm. demos right now. Primarily what I do is some way or not connected to an MES, but Tulip eventually gets used for lab software, maintenance and tooling tracking, things that historically have not been a part of an MES. They've been a whole another three letter, four letter acronym. But again, with this low code technology, you can build whatever you want. Yeah, interesting, actually. I was going to ask you, because when I talk about operational intelligence with, with my clients or candidates, we're often talking about data analytics, data historians, and such like that. Yep. So is that similar functionality to Intulip and, and with other platforms as well? Yep. So we saw bits and pieces of this. Tulip has built in, and I think other low-code platforms have this same concept, a dashboarding and reporting functionality. Mm. So for example, without even opening an app, you might be aggregating the up and down time of your critical machines. And inside of Tulip, you can build reports that show, you know, this machine was 80% available the past month. That machine was 70% available the past mm. month. So all that is sort of baked in. And the other nice thing is that everything in Tulip is exposed to being integrated with other tools. So you hear this concept of the UNS a lot lately. Mm. A huge, fl- I don't know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> um, a huge monument that Tulip was built on is the ability to integrate with other systems, whether that's pulling data in or sending data out. So as you capture maybe, like I showed, component traceability, sending out a transaction to your ERP system or to your UNS so that anyone can quickly go grab what that is. So I really see Tulip as a part of a web, unlike more classical MES to ERP mindset. Oh, I appreciate that. And look, I'm I'm really grateful for for you taking the time to walk through this. And and look, I know you're heavily working with the Tulip platform, and you know, obviously, yep. naturally, there's a lot of the Tulip branding and the talk about the Tulip platform. But I have appreciated your um, openness to talk about low code and you know objectivity in this space. And I think my goal yep. in this episode was to raise awareness and to give some insight and to educate some of the audience and listeners yep. about low code MES. So, so I have appreciated your objectivity as, as much as you can do. Yeah, yeah. I think there's. So much room for more of this. I think all the manufacturing software companies are aware of it and they're adding functionality or they're building new platforms to kind of meet this demand. Uh, we have a, a new generation of workers who mm. demand better technology and they're really good at it. So we need to keep putting it in their hands and letting those people at the ground level generate ROI using these tools. Yeah, I mean, when I saw the PDF in the demo of the uh, work instructions, I mean, it, it just scared the life out of me. The thought of having <laughs> now an iPad with stick glue here, stick that there, that makes it much more palatable for the next generation of, of frontline workers, right? Yep. And uh, I would say on your end, it brings about a different angle on recruiting of the types of people that you need to be hiring in these manufacturing and process engineer type roles. Yeah, definitely. And, and with always, you know, especially in MES, it's always been, you know, someone from an IT background who, who knows how to program, but, you know, maybe interested in manufacturing or someone like yourself from a manufacturing background who's right. open to IT. But if we've now got a platform, a tool that somebody who's not deeply versed in either way, but can build and, and operate, then, you know, that makes life much easier for, for everyone within the plant. Yeah. And um, look, Daniel, I think, you know, from my side, one of the things that was really impressed with when we first met was your openness to to want to educate, to want to raise awareness, you know, from your side, but also to educate people. And, you know, I think that's something a lot of the listeners can do, follow you on your YouTube channel. Uh, yep. Maybe you can talk a little bit about where people can find your content and where people can engage with you. Yep. Yep. So my most prominent channels are LinkedIn and YouTube. Please connect with me, uh, message me. I'm happy to meet with anyone who's curious about these types of things at any time. My YouTube channel has been a fun, it started off as a business decision, but it's actually descended into uh, me doing things that I think are fun. Um, so I have some 
educational content on manufacturing SQL, manufacturing IoT, machine learning projects, things that aren't necessarily related to my business, but they are. And over time, we'll see how much my YouTube channel is just about broad manufacturing education or if I'm going to hone in and do mostly low code. I expect I'll probably keep on making videos of whatever I think is cool. So I don't know if it's been the best business decision for me, but it's certainly fun. Hey, I'd be surprised to think that, you know, doing things that you enjoy that come easy, they're going to provide great content for people. And look, yeah, you're right. Maybe it's not traditionally filling the top of the funnel, but I guess if people can be aware, be educated and, and hold you in high esteem, then, then it's only a plus for, for life in general. Yep. Yep. And I've actually gotten some really great feedback on my videos, which has forced me to rethink how I would uh, like solve those problems in the future. So mm. I appreciate all feedback, both on the videos and the actual technology implementation. No, great. Well, look, again, thanks, Daniel, for joining me. I think it's been a great episode and, and looking forward to hearing all the feedback from the, the audience on, on this episode. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to me, everybody. And uh, stay tuned because there's only more to come and there's only going to be more bright folks like myself involved in this space. So yeah, start sounds now. Good to me. Sounds good to me. All right. Talk soon, Daniel. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's it for another episode. I hope you enjoyed it and most importantly, took some knowledge and insight moving forward. If you're a fan of the podcast, please subscribe and hit like. And if you're a super fan, please share with your colleagues and friends. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please drop me a line on LinkedIn or via email. Details below. Thanks for listening.